This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Benny Fowler, Group Vice President, World Quality, Ford Motor Company. Plus, we look at the pros and cons, mostly pros, of 5S. That and more when we come back. Today's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is Tuve Sued America. Sign up for Tuve Sued America's free webinar, ISO 50001 2011 Energy Management at tuvamerica.com slash ISO 50001 webinar. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for March 2nd, 2012. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest contributing editor, Ryan Day. I'm sitting in for Dirk Ducharme, who is on assignment in Hawaii. Yes, he's, he's checking the quality of Mai Tais, I believe, at <laughs> Joe's Kona Shake Shack in Dirk, Surf Shop. Put, put down the Mai Tai and pay attention. Yes, Dirk. So he's, he's such a hardworking guy, that Dirk. Yes, we, we love him. Well, all right, moving on. Our first top story, top news story this week, comes from our friends at ISO. Now, we've got an automotive theme on the show today, particularly since we're soon to be joined by Benny Fowler of the Ford Motor Company. Now, this piece from ISO, meanwhile, talks about the future of the industry and, of course, the importance of standards in shaping that future. The article, which originally appeared in the ISO Focus Plus magazine, is out just in time for the Geneva International Motor Show later this month. Included in the show is the Networked Car Workshop, which focuses on the car of the future and the intelligent transportation systems needed to support it. And more on that Interesting subject. In, in a moment. Interesting subject. Now, in the piece, ISO interviewed leading auto industry executives and other prominent individuals and asked them to assess how standards and standard implementation helps develop and build better cars, manage risk in the supply chain, and better serve customers. ISO received comments from Sergio Marchione, CEO of Fiat and Chrysler, former Soviet statesman and Peace Prize laureate Mikhail Gorbachev, and many others. The general consensus is that critical issues involving the environment, safety, and new technology can best be managed through standards-based systems. Interesting. Now, the hundreds and hundreds of ISO standards within the automotive space essentially fall under the purview of a pair of technical committees, ISO TC22, with the general label of road vehicles, and the more specific ISO TC204, intelligent transportation systems. Again, we hit that. Now, it's this later technical committee, TC204, that we found of the greatest interest here, because they're talking about, again, intelligent transportation systems. And, and, and what does that mean? It means a lot of things. You know, in, in, in the ISO Focus Plus article itself, right. it was, was interesting that even though we're talking standards, the, the uh, viewpoints or, or the angle that, that each uh, CEO and expert came at it from was anything but standardized. Right. A lot of different viewpoints on, on what standards mean to the industry. Right, but, and, but how that all fits into the idea that ISO, again, with their hundreds of standards which dictate how you need to have processes for a lot of things involved in automotive manufacturing uh, and supply chain. Uh, those, those standards kind of wrap around all these issues, again, of an environment, huge, of safety. Huge group of issues. The, the range of issues, everything from, from, like you say, manufacturer and risk management, mm -hmm. all the way to uh, uh, usage at the other end because we had some of the CEOs that seemed, at least in the article, that seemed to be uh, more focused on, okay, look, if we're going to be um, producing more uh, EVs, electrical vehicles, well, we need a standardized way to, to uh, juice them up once right. they get on the road, actually right. on the road with the consumers. Mm -hmm. Others were much more interested in, dare I say, almost a social engineering yes. viewpoint on, on uh, uh, automotive industries, um, social responsibility, place in the world, the culture, and and a, and a car is a lot of things. We talked about this already in the past. A car is many yeah. things, many right. symbols for people, for consumers. I want to talk for a minute though about this idea of ITS, intelligent yes. transportation yes. systems, because this is an interesting one. Intelligent transportation systems, you know, involve a lot of things, and and you know some of them obviously we know, you know, the GPS, the OnStar you know, those types of things. But there's a lot that goes into that about how to, how to use technology to design and redesign the way that people use their transportation systems, their automobiles. There, there was an interesting uh, item that I found that in, in Japan now, they are be beginning to develop systems where 
where your car can sense if there is a blockage, an accident, a stalled vehicle in the oh, lane, okay, which okay. is a mile in front of you, so you can be prepared for that. It's a brilliant really, piece of design. It is. It is really like um, um, taking the next step in, in the usage of GPS, uh, you know, TomTom -tom technology. Sure. Taking that another step toward. And this is something that I'm, you know, I'm not a huge fan of bells and whistles and gadgets. I'm just not. But uh, when it comes to things like that, man, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Using something, taking these, you're seeing it more and more in the automotive industry where they're taking these things, taking an integrative approach to it. And um, uh, it, it's fascinating. I mean, like you say, with, with that, cars that are literally now, uh, hands off parallel parking, mm -hmm. you know, these are applications of, of these technologies that just, it, this is it's it's James Bond stuff. Yeah, you yeah. know, right now it is, and it is right now. And Way it, past it, Dick Tracy. We're yeah, James Bond. <laughs> we're, we're, we're Roy Rogers or whatever. Roy, yeah, you know, we're all the way to Roy Rogers now, and, yeah. and it's coming it to is, the streets. You know, and it is, and, and the automotive industry is is just a fascinating entree, it's an entry point into the kind of the minds of of the way people people obviously transport themselves, but also think about the impact they make in society in mm. terms of the environment, economically. Again, the car is a statement of a lot of things, is a symbol of a lot of things. And and I think this this idea of, of of intelligent transportation systems, the idea of what of what ISOFocus talked about in their in their article, which is which is great. I recommend that you you all read that. Um, That's I, a, a great issue, it, by the way. It, this it, particular it, issue of ISOFocus Plus. And 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 what they're gonna be talking about the show in Geneva, uh, which uh, I don't know how many of you out there can attend that, but the show in Geneva. Geneva's, Geneva's nice that time it's of year. Beautiful in in, in March. Uh, is is this idea of, of what the future looks like and and where where we're headed in this very very important sector for all of us as as consumers and for all of us in quality. Sure, shirts automotive has led the way for decades in, in our industry so it's 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 i think nice it's very interesting so nice I to see encourage nice you to, see. to check that out which and if we continue our automotive theme yes we should we should that brings us to our uh, guest today mm -hmm. and that would be benny fowler ford motor company's own group vice president world quality benny how the hell are you all right how are you doing today it's I great to be here with you Fantastic. I'm very excited to have you here today. Uh, you are one very busy amigo, Benny. Uh, new products coming out, uh, car shows. Uh, in fact, just last weekend, you spoke at the ISO 9000 conference. You were a keynote speaker, weren't you? Tell us again, what was the, the uh, topic that you, that you spoke about? Well, we spent a little time talking about the uh, quality journey at Ford. I spent a little time going back in the history of Ford, uh, really talking about the theme of uh, the Ford Motor Company being key to bring affordable transportation to all mankind. We, we spent a little time also talking about the journey of Ford, and obviously, you know, um, the industry has been through some tough times, and Ford has not been exempt from that, and how we've actually used our uh, overall enterprise quality operating system to help us um, uh, turn our company around. Yeah, boy, history and Ford. There's there there are two words that go together. Yes. I mean, there's mm -hmm. that's a tremendous history. You're a history buff yourself. I, I am, and I, I'm I'm glad you touched on that, Benny, because the legacy of Ford is one, and and I don't know that that a lot of people really realize that a lot of of what we now know today is as lean really were developed, you know, as much as a hundred years ago by by Henry Ford, uh, in the Rouge River plant, and and the original plants that. That uh, that Ford had in the early early 20th century. So, can you talk a little bit about some of the efficiencies and, and how Ford owns the idea of lean or the, the the concept of lean, if not the actual out and out name of lean? How Ford adapts that and brings that forward into the future? Well, I think uh, if you think back to history, uh, Henry Ford actually developed the first uh, production system, uh, building Model Ts, uh, some time ago. And the basic idea was to take raw material and turn it into finished goods and to do that at the most efficient and, and, and affordable way possible. And also going back in history, uh, certainly helping to create the middle class by offering the $5 a day wage uh, for, for a lot of Americans uh, at that time. So um, a great history, as you talked about in terms of uh, uh, producing the, great, the first assembly line as well as uh, 
uh, uh, being uh, of service to all of mankind. And when I look at and study the history of the Ford Motor Company, that 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 notion of uh, bringing affordable uh, vehicles and affordable technology to all mankind is steeped in our history and is really a part of what's really driving us today. One of the things I, I loved about Henry Ford and, and loved reading about him was this idea, as you say, the $5 day, where his concept was really a brilliant one, and it was a simple one, that he wanted his his workers, his line workers, to be able to afford to also be his customers and paying them enough to be able to afford the products that he was rolling off his assembly lines. He, he kind of wins in both ways that way, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of a brilliant, brilliant and, insight. Another lean strategy. And a, and a lean strategy. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, you've made all the key points for me, so no <laughs> need uh, uh, to repeat those comments. Uh, you, you have it all in a nutshell. <laughs> Henry Ford, the Henry. godfather of lean. He, absolutely. I mean, you know, gosh, you're talking about it more than 100 years ago. I got really quite a legacy. Uh, Benny, I want to talk about, about moving forward a little bit. And, and one thing that we are, are always really interested in here at Quality Digest and our readers are is, is elements of the supply chain and, and risk management. Hey, nobody has a crystal ball. None of us know what's going to happen in the future with natural disasters or wars or oil price increases, whatever the case may be, but how do you and your team kind of try to look over the horizon as much as you can at, at potential risks in dealing with your suppliers and mitigating those risks and, and ensuring quality? Well, the very first thing that we work on here at Ford is really trying to establish a great partnership with our suppliers. And I think communication is a key element of what we've been trying to do to move our company forward and to move our relationships forward with our suppliers. And we have a notion uh, in, in, in our, on our overall, uh, the way we uh, present ourselves, with, which suggests that it should be profitable growth for all, which means not only the Ford Motor Company, but our suppliers and all of our key stakeholders to benefit from the work that we do. And I think as long as you have that as your basic thought process, as your basic way of doing business, and then work on the understanding of designing and developing cars and components that deliver what the customers want, we will all survive. And I think the way we do that is starting off with uh, good engineering uh, standards, good process standards, and good quality confirmation standards to really help us deliver the products and services that we want. And I think it's as simple as that. As you pointed out, um, um, the, the environment has been very volatile uh, uh, over the last four or five years. And I think the one thing that we've enjoyed is the relationship with our suppliers that has allowed us to handle you know, various risk factors that has confronted us, that has confronted us, confronted us over the last uh, couple of years or so. Mm -hmm. You talked about supplying product to, to the customers and, and, and ensuring quality through that. There was a recent article that the AP circulated uh, just a few days ago, I think it was, <clears throat> I believe it was February 27th, that, that talked about the fact that Detroit expects this year to, to have orders for more than a million more cars than it did last year. That, that's great. Hey, it's great news for, for U.S. auto manufacturers, definitely. Um, but it, it raises a, a point, it raises a question. How do you ensure quality when you're in that growth phase and you're, you're having to add line workers and, and how do you get those line workers? Ryan, you, you, you are a, a old gearhead and you've been, <laughs> you've been in, the, in the space for a long time. And, well, in, spent decades in production and volume repair. So the question really is how do you, and this is the question for Benny is, how do you bring people in and give them that knowledge when you bring them onto the line, maybe for the first time. Well, I was wondering, actually, Benny, uh, as far as uh, ramping up production, and and we spoke about this, uh, how uh, production uh, orders for Ford are, are picking up yep. uh, at a great pace. Yep. Is there the avenue for um, uh, bringing uh, skilled workers, uh, former workers, maybe. back mm -hmm. onto the line? Mm -hmm. Is that is that part of uh, what's going on at Ford, or, or possibly going on? Well, let me, let me try to start with this in, in a couple of ways. The one thing that we've been working on over the last uh, five years is strengthening our quality operating system. The basic way and the basic standard approach that we're going to be using to run our uh, manufacturing location, whether it be assembly, powertrain, stamping, uh, anything that we, we, we manufacture. So it's that standardization that's allowing us to be able to take a basic system, 
and to deliver the best cars and trucks that we've been that 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 we have delivered over time and over the last five years the Ford Motor Company has probably been the most improved auto manufacturer um, you know, based upon all the data we've been able to look at. So taking the training element, I think that when you start to bring new workers on, we start with uh, bringing back our employees that might have been laid off over time, and I think that uh, we'll fundamentally have uh, everybody back that uh, wants to come back to the Ford Motor Company. So that's step one. And obviously, if you've been off for some time, what we start off with some basic work hardening elements for for all the all of the operators before they ever get onto the assembly line. We'll basically be taking them through some static training offline before they ever get onto the assembly line. Then once uh, the the uh, employees are ready, we'll start to pair them up with uh, uh, operators that are basically on the on the line doing the same job that 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 uh, they will be doing when they move to the ship that they're going to be going to. So we'll spend enough time to get the operator's proficiency up before they actually are placed on the assembly line by themselves. So then at a certain point, we'll back the experienced operator away and have him observing the operation with the operator in place. And once we deem that that operator is proficient and he's capable of performing the job, uh, uh, the way we want it without hurting himself first and producing the quality of levels, then and only then we will put him on an assembly line by himself. That seems to uh, dovetail into something I heard you say from uh, last year's ASQ World Conference where you spoke, and I was watching that on YouTube. Everything's on YouTube. Uh, and I heard you say a very interesting thing, and that was advancements in quality start with leadership teams. Now, is that something you're touching on with the people on the line? Is the, the leadership teams, those are right on the floor. Is that right? That's correct? Well, we have, uh, in every one of our assembly plant, we'll have work group teams. That's one form of teams that are always working on uh, continuous improvement and delivering uh, quality to, the, to, the, uh, to, the, to our end customers. Then what we have in every one of our uh, assembly location and powertrain uh, locations, we have what we call variability reduction teams. And those teams are focused on looking at the basic elements, any information that comes into our, from our customers, example, we can get a warranty claim from our dealerships within 48 hours of a claim being put in by a customer. That information comes into our assembly plants or our powertrain locations every day, and we work on adjusting our manufacturing standards based upon you know, what we hear from our customers. So it's real time, real focus, uh, real adjustments every, we call, we, we have a saying that says we're going to work on every claim every day. That is great. Benny, before you go, I've just got one more thing. Being a huge fan, of, I'm actually a Ford fan myself, a huge fan of the old Ford GT40 from the 60s, which beat the pants off the Ferrari in the Le Mans <laughs> races. <laughs> and brought back in 2006 for a 4,000 car production run. There's rumor about a 2012 GT supercar. Can you, can you comment on that? <laughs> or is it, I, I just wanted to let you know that if you need test drive services <laughs> for, that, for that development. It's your man. I, I'm your man, so just, I'm just saying. Well, uh, no, I, I heard some of those rumors myself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now that you're both, oh, looks I'll like I'll certainly uh, look forward to putting you behind the wheel. <laughs> All <laughs> right, <laughs> I'll, I'll look forward to it. All right, well, uh, Benny. Well, Benny. Benny, thank, thank you so much for, for joining us here today. We'll, we'll leave it at that. We're, Ryan is very excited now, and that's, that's a good way. Uh, thank you, really, Benny, for joining us today again. Uh, that's Benny Fowler. He is the, uh, the, the, uh, the group, group Vice group President, President World Quality for Ford, Ford Motor, Motor Company. Company. Benny, thank you again for joining us, and we'll, we'll catch up with you later. Okay. Well, good, good segment there. And I, I, I think that, you know, we, we have a lot, we love covering those stories because you're talking about a manufacturer, you're talking about a, a company that is doing great work and a great American company doing great work and is, and is showing uh, growth. And, and we, we love covering that. And we love talking about it from the perspective of quality. Any success so, story is a good one. Is a good one, absolutely. All right, well, I have another success story. And this one is about, about a methodology that also is, you know, relatively, is analogous to automotive, certainly is prevalent in the automotive industry. That's 5S. 
Now, we ran two articles this week uh, in Quality Digest Daily, and I'm actually going to uh, share them here with you. Uh, two articles that we ran in Quality Digest Daily this week. The first one was from our, our good friend Stuart Anderson, and that appeared in Tuesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily, entitled To 5S or Not To 5S? That is the question. That is the question. And we also ran another article uh, the next day, actually, from Mike Micklewright, another one of our frequent columnists, entitled, Five S is More Than a Tool. And that, again, ran in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Now, for any of you who don't know, and most of you do, but if any of you don't know, Five S is, is a core lean practice, and, it, and it, it's Japanese in origin, and I won't bother to go through the Japanese. Your Japanese is a little rusty. My Japanese is <laughs> a little rusty. I could, I could try it, but I don't think you'd like that. So instead, I will give you the English translations, sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. And those are the five S's, the five English S's that, that deal with this methodology. And really what it is, is it's really about organizing your work, understanding your work, flowing your work, keeping it visual. It's, it's very important. It, it, and it's, it's an organizational structure. Uh, it's a tool. It's also a philosophy in many ways. And that's kind of the root of what I want to talk about, which is a divergence, an apparent divergence, between the, the spin that, that Stewart took on this article and the spin that Mike took on this article. Stewart talks about, about 5S and says, well, it's, it's really a tool, basically. It's great, it's useful, everybody should use it, especially if you're in some of these manufacturing environments. Uh, automotive is a great, great example. You should definitely use 5S, it should be part of what you're doing, but it's not a philosophy, it's not the be all end all because it's, it's limited. And if you try to, as he says, you know, approach that as, as, as the hammer and every question is a nail and 5S is that hammer, you're gonna, you're gonna be lost along the way. Mike's spin on it was that 5S it, it can be and should be a central tenet, it should be core to what you're doing if you're in that environment. And that, that you, it, it's not only a tool, but it's also a philosophy. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I took it that way, but just, slightly different as mm -hmm. I read it that that yes a philosophy and a tenet but not again just like you were saying right. that, as stewards not the the entire no. philosophy just one might call it a tool one might call it a philosophy but they both had that same take on it yeah yeah I think Mike's Mike's take was that it is more of a guiding force rather than Stewart's take on it was that it is a, a, a piece of a larger puzzle. And Mike says it's a piece of a larger puzzle too, but right. it's more central that, piece. Both had that integrative right. a, view, appro approach, uh, approach of it. Yes. And they both, they both refer, well, Mike refers often, and Mike, Mike McWright is, a, of all the, the people that I know in this industry, Mike may be the most prevalent Demingite working today. And, and, and so Mike would agree with, with a Stewart, one of Stewart's comments, which was that, you know, copying shouldn't be, shouldn't be really in, in, embraced that much. And Deming was always on this idea of, of don't copy. You know, look at your own internal DNA of your culture and, and do what works for you. And one of the things that Stewart points out about 5S is that it was, it's kind of copied from TPS, from the Toyota production system. And, and many organizations try to look at what Toyota did with it or what other Japanese companies did with 5S and bring it over wholesale and not adapt it for what they're necessarily doing. That, I agree, that is wrong. That, that level of copying doesn't make sense. Um, but if, you know, as they say, if you make it your own, or I guess you just said that, if, if you make it your own, look, Toyota learned sure. from Ford, sure. made it their own. Sure. But, well, they, but they didn't really copy. There was a difference here. That's right. They that's did, right. They that was copy. the difference. Uh, Deming, again, and, and I, 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 I do love the history. Deming and Duran and Thigamam, as we talked about last week on, on the show, went over to Japan and shared with them a lot of the, the production systems that, that Ford dev devised uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. But again, they did take it for their own. Right. Adapt their own culture. Their culture. Adapted. Their and then, way of thinking. And then with, uh, with uh, if Japan can, why can't we? That kind of came back, and Deming came back in the late 70s yeah. uh, to America. And then that's when the copying really began to be prevalent, where people said, oh gosh, oh, well, you know, Japan is kicking our butts, and, and let's just see what they're doing, and, and, and figure that out and bring it yeah. over here and try to copy it. And that, that's not really what you want to do, no. you know, if you can't avoid it. You want to try to embrace it and bring it into your, into your culture. So, Again, I, I think both of these articles are very, very well worth reading. Uh, links to both of them are, are right below the player here, and you can read them. Uh, both of them got some good comments. Good comments. Good Love comments, comments from the I, readers. And I, I want to I get to those here, if I can remember how to do it. Alt-tab, as Dirk told me. Okay, thank you, Dirk. Okay, the first one, uh, this was uh, a comment that came in to, uh, to Stewart's article, to 5S or not to 5S. 
and it, it's from R. A. Johnson, who's, who who writes writes in frequently and comments on articles. 5S is the simplest, most visible tool in the box to gauge readiness and progress. Therefore, I must respectfully disagree and say it, it is perhaps the most essential tool for a successful company. In my experience, the failing of 5S comes from companies looking to have the look and feel of lean instead of embracing the heart and soul of continuous improvement. I think we all could agree with that. I think Stuart would agree with that too. That again, it's not about copying right. something that worked over there and, and just kind of having the, the look and feel, the, the surface of it. Embrace it and, em and embrace what it really means from the perspective of continuous improvement, not from just, well, they're doing it, so we have How to How does it look? Well. What's our scorecard look like? What's, yeah, exactly right. As, and, as we used to say in the service, it doesn't have to, for an inspection, it doesn't have to be clean. <laughs> it has to have the appearance <laughs> of <clean>. being clean. <laughs> it doesn't have to be lean. That is an excellent analogy, and I think that that's <clears throat> exactly what we're talking about here. But if you if you embrace that, really, and many really, companies really. do, and, and that's what the articles we're talking about, yeah. embrace it, embrace make it, it your own, right. you know, make it a part of your a part of your your uh, philosophy. That's right. Well, you know, we got another comment not on Stuart's article, but on Mike's article from uh, another friend of ours. Ah. Paul Naismith. Paul Naismith. And Paul Naismith is a, is a columnist as well, and, and Paul and Mike know each other very well. So Mike, at, at one point in his article, talked about this idea of oopsie-doopsie, oopsie-daisy oopsie proofing, daisy. which is like, oh, well, you know, let's, let's, now, let's now look at it again and figure it out because something went, went awry. But, but Paul thinks that maybe there may have been something lost in translation here. In so. trans, well, Paul being the, Scottish. the flying Scotsman. Yes, he is. Uh, yes, he is. So he, he, his, maybe you want to read this one and, and give us your take on it. Is your garlic a little rusty then? <laughs> You're in luck then, Mike. <laughs> well, let's see. Paul Naismith writes in, As a proud Scot, and to help the many other Scottish readers, the translation from English of Oopsie Daisy Proofing into Scots would be, and I quote, Anything to stop that dumpling from... Do we have a delay? Can yeah, I say no, this? No, we can't. We can't, okay. Anything to stop that <laughs> dumpling from the friggin' things up again. 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 Well, Paul, thank you for that. You know, he, he never really got back to us on, on being a, a quality Barbie. <laughs> Scott, Scottish Nick McBarbie. Barbie still down. We, we covered Paul. that last week on the show. So, Paul, let us know what Where you thought about you? that. We really want to hear your, your comments. Well, thank you, Paul. That was, that was uh, very well done, I think. And... Uh, and I like those articles. Actually, they're both were good them. articles. They both were good articles. Uh, so check them out nice again. Link, links are right below the player. You can you can check them out. Okay. Uh, unless you're looking at it recorded, and then the links. No, the links are still right still there. Still down below. I think they're still, or they might be over there. They're they're around. They're on they're the page around. somewhere. Check them out. You'll find them. All right. That's our show for this week. But before we close, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Tuve Suit America. Learn more about how your business can increase energy efficiency, reduce energy costs, and save money by implementing an energy management system. Sign up for Tuvesud America's free webinar, ISO 50001-2011 Energy Management at www.tvamerica.com slash ISO 50001 webinar. That's a lot. So you can also click on the banner ad just below again, or if you're watching on demand, just to the right of the player over there and check out that webinar. It's a good one. And hey, next week, mm -hmm. uh, stay tuned for uh, Donald Wheeler's yes. article, The Right Answer, Wrong question. Oh, does that happen a lot? <laughs> yeah, Man. it's a great answer. It's yeah. just not the right question. <laughs> Look forward to that next week happens on a Quality lot. Digest Daily. Donald Wheeler, always one of our most popular columnists. I'm sure you'll all be looking out for that. And uh, one more thing I want you to look out for. Coming up soon is our next episode of Technorazi Live, which Ooh. will be broadcasting live, of course, from Hexagon Metrology's North American headquarters in North Kingston, Rhode Island. The event happens live, again, on April 12th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be demoing Hexagon's newest yet-to-be-announced product. Ooh, very interested in that. So keep an eye on your email. More information will be coming soon on how you can check that out and register to attend the event. And we'll be presenting a special episode of QDL on the following day, Friday, April 13th. April 13th, hey. QDL. Uh-oh. That's going to have some unique guests, some great features, uh, a little bit of a different show. Some market calendars, and check that one out. Check, make sure you check out the Technorazi Live the day before and, and QDL on the 13th. And that won't be coming broadcast from Hawaii with Dirk? Uh, unfortunately not. But, but maybe one of these weeks we'll, we'll get out to Hawaii, at least I will, and we'll check that out. So that's our show. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you all have a great weekend. Dirk? Enjoy that Mai Tai. <laughs> Go back to the sand, Dirk. That's right. And we will uh, we'll see you all next week.